Hi, my name's Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at Trillium. I was talking with the congregation on Sunday about someone wanting to learn how to play the piano. I mean, they start out with a desire. And I thought there was three basic steps one would go through. Well, first of all, you'd get a piano. Some people actually take the piano and start to study it without getting a piano right off the bat, but it doesn't take long before they need a piano. And, and step two is get a piano teacher. Seems pretty obvious. You need someone to coach or guide you on how to learn how to play the piano. And then step three is practice. And you'd be surprised how many people get the piano and they start taking weekly lessons with the piano teacher, but they forget to do the practice part. I'm here to mention to you that it's the practice part that's most important of all. Unless you practice at something, you're not going to get uh, any kind of proficiency in it. And I was using that as an analogy for, for the church, too. If you want to follow Jesus, and we articulate that here at Trillium as being God's hands in the world, do you want to join with Jesus in being God's hands in the world? Then it seems to me the first thing you do is you pick a church. And step two, you go to church on a fairly consistent basis to get instruction and direction how to be God's hands. And then step three you practice. Just like the piano, you need to practice being God's hands in life. And it's in the practice that one begins to develop the facility, the capacity to do that uh, hard task of offering friendship and fellowship to all. That's what we understand. The purpose of being God's hands is to offer friendship and fellowship to all. To all. Not just a few or some, but to all. And it's the all part that makes it so hard. And then we come back we get more instruction, and we go out and practice again. We get the opportunity to keep practicing over and over again. One of the things that I've learned the hard way is that this practice, while it's individualistic in some sense, is also a community practice. And that you really can't grow into the, uh, fulfilling one's practice with, unless one begins to collaborate with other people, talk about it with other people, reflect on it with other people. I know as a musician, and I was a musician before I was a minister, that it was very tempting to just simply be caught up in one's own practice and not, in a sense, collaborate with others. But in, in musicianship, it's so critical to play with other people, whether you're playing in a rock band or a string trio or in an orchestra or a concert band. It's so critical in your musicianship to play with other people. There are so many piano players who have no sense of time they don't, aren't able to keep steady time because they don't play with anybody else. And their musicianship suffers for it. Myself, I, I went to University of Toronto, got a Bachelor of Music and Performance degree, got associateships and other diplomas, and yet at the end of the process, I'm playing with a, a, an orchestral player, friend of mine, and he says to me, Mark, your timing's terrible. Your timing is terrible. And I realized I'd gone through this whole uh, musical education had learned some critical elements of what makes music worth. And it's because I hadn't really taken seriously the idea of collaborating with others. You know, the practice of being God's hands in life requires us to join together and grow and learn together how to do this. I uh, was reflecting with a friend of mine about a situation I'd found myself in in a parking lot at a Peter restaurant. I talked about that a couple weeks ago, about how this guy had come up to me out of the side while I was just about to chunk down into a shawarma pita. And all of a sudden, I saw him waving at me. He wanted something from me, and I, I missed the moment of it. I simply waved him off and drove away without ever engaging him. In, and I missed the opportunity to be God's hands in life and to offer friendship and fellowship to all. And my friend and I were sitting there with reflecting on what I might have done. I, I might have bought him a pita. I might have given him some money. I, I might have even just rolled down the window and talked to find out what he needed. And I'm thinking to myself, and my friend says to me, you had one thing, you could have just given him your pita sandwich if he was hungry. And I'm saying to myself, yeah, yeah, I'll go up and I'll buy myself another one. And he says to me, no, you just give him your pita and drive away. And in that moment, a light bulb went on. The opportunity for substitution revealed itself to me. In a sense, there was a trade going on there, a transaction of love. I gave him my sandwich and he gives me his hunger and I drive home with his hunger. That's the core of the gospel moment too. Jesus comes to us, offers us his connection with God and with neighbor in, in place of our alienation from God and from neighbor. In a sense, he gives us his shawarma sandwich and takes upon us our hunger. We see that in, in parents who will push children out of their way and take upon their child's danger and put their child into relative safety and security. 
I've heard so many parents say to me how they would wish to be able to substitute themselves for their child's pain in life, too, and are not able to do that. That's the gospel. That's the goodness of life. And it's something that we only grow in as we practice it together. 